Welcome to the Skies Over Colorado for April 2022. I am staff astronomer John Ensworth for Cherrywood Observatory, volunteer at the Little Thompson Observatory in Berthoud for Longmont Public Media. In the news, our standard James Webb telescope update. So it is doing great. Still getting ready to start taking scientific images. Uh, they are cooling the instruments that uh, need to operate at nearly absolute zero so we can see deep into the infrared part of the spectrum. If the instruments are not cold, then the telescope is basically making its own light source locally that would make it blind to the signal that we're trying to see back in the earlier times of the universe. So it's heading for uh, negative 223 degrees Celsius. That's negative 369.4 Fahrenheit. So yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's only um, 12 degrees Fahrenheit above absolute zero. So the instrument in question is called the mid-infrared instrument and it is getting cooler and cooler and cooler. They are taking a look at the alignment of the mirrors. This is a test an evaluation image and all the little lens shaped things around the picture here are distant galaxies. Speaking of distant galaxies, using ground-based observatories, uh, the Subaru Telescope, Vista Telescope, the UK Infrared Telescope, and the Spitzer Space Telescope, so one up in space, uh, we have now a new record holder for the most distant, we suspect, uh, galaxy. So this is a thousand two hundred hours of observing time. My goodness. And it is this red little guy right here. The reason it's red is because at that great distance the universe is expanding uh, throughout all the universe and the light from that uh, galaxy is being expanded as well as it travels more spaces appearing in the light path and so to our instruments and our eyes, when you make a wavelength longer, you make it redder. We call that redshift. This is expected or suspected to be 13.5 billion light years away, and that it came into existence only 330 million years after the Big Bang. So that's uh, pretty amazing, and it could be the earliest supermassive black hole as well. So this has turned out to be a little fuzzy, but taking a look from the present. Going back in time, <coughs> you have the Big Bang itself, you have a time when the uh, universe is so dense and hot that light could not travel, and then you have the edge of the cosmic microwave background radiation where the universe did become transparent to light, just like light getting out of the center of the sun. It takes a long time, hundreds of thousands of years, to make it out from the center to the surface, and then it leaps free from what we see is the surface and gets to the Earth in just eight and a half minutes. The truth is you can fly an airplane at about 10% down the radius of the Earth if you could stand the heat, because that's about where one Earth atmospheric pressure is found. So here it is, there's the uh, most distant galaxy confirmed to date, and this one goes way back into this time period, so we'll see if it is true. Alright, change of pace here, we are looking at using astronomy to see the interior secret voids inside the pyramid. So what they're going to do is bring um, uh, muon detectors uh, and place them around the base of the pyramid and let cosmic rays slam into the Earth's atmosphere because they're doing that anyways and part of the scatter of particles that comes out of that muons can penetrate through stone like this vastly better than well x-rays can't go that far so they are going to slowly build up a high resolution picture of the interior structures kind of crazy Big star parties. A lot of stuff is coming back now. So we have uh, Pensacola, uh, Florida, a couple of them. We got Tucson Astronomy Festival, Texas Star Party is a big one in the end of April. Bootleg Spring Star Party in the end of April as well. Uh, May, Pensacola repeats with a couple more uh, public observing times. Your Astro 101 note this time is well, talking about the nature of light. We, we 
use light a lot to see what the universe is doing because light can travel throughout the entire uh, universe and get to our sensors and our eyes. Well, there's a little technical uh, definition, but let me break that down. So light is a transverse, which means it's got things at a right angles to each other, electromagnetic wave that can uh, be seen by the typical human eye. So it's actually a tiny slice of the center, as we'll see in just a moment, but uh, it's actually much longer, much shorter wavelengths are all part of the electromagnetic spectrum, like the light that we see. So they can travel through a vacuum, composed of waves, well, and also particles, because everything subatomic is both particle and wave in nature. These particles represent a quantum of light, or <coughs> other electromagnetic radiation, that have zero rest mass. So there's two ways of making light come, come out of matter. If something is greater than 800 Kelvin, which is extremely cold, uh, it will give off uh, electromagnetic radiation. And also, if an atom is has its electrons boosted to a higher orbital, I'm not going to get into that detail, and then the electrons fall back down again, you get luminescence. And you see that in glow in the dark paint, and toys and compounds, and also fireflies and things like that. So it travels at the speed C, which meters per second is 299792458 meters per second or 186,000 miles per second. And that is in a vacuum. If you start uh, putting air through other media like, uh, I'm sorry, light through other media like air or water, glass, it does slow down. The skies above your backyard. Well, we start and end this month also with a new moon, just like last time. So, a blue new moon. It's not really a thing. Uh, April 9th is our first quarter. April 16th, we're full. And third quarter is April 23rd. In the evening, there's not much to see. Mercury is coming rapidly up out of the uh, sun as the month goes on. So, at first, it's not really there. Uh, Mid-month, it's about an hour after sunset, you, you can still see it, and by the end of the month, it'll be a little bit better than that. Uh, at the middle of the month, Uranus is also low in the uh, southwest, sorry, uh, and setting about an hour after sunset. So here they are, really low, neither of them are very bright or easy to see, so not much of a show. And at midnight, we don't have anything up that you're going to see in a backyard telescope or with eyes or binoculars. But everything is in the morning sky. So we have Saturn rising about three hours before sunrise, Mars about two and a half, Venus about two hours, Neptune about one and a half, and Jupiter about one hour, should be one hour before sunrise. Who edits these things? Uh, so here they are all. Because of the tilt of the ecliptic, it, the planets in the morning sky are all very low in the south southeastern sky. So, But they're down there, and it's quite a show if you have a clear southeast horizon. We start the month with the sun rising at 6.45 a.m., going all the way back to 6 a.m. at the end of the month. Uh, sunset backs from 7.24 to 7.53. And we go from 12 hours, roughly 40 minutes, to an hour and 10 minutes more light by the end of the month. And the sun's uh, altitude above the southern horizon at local noon gains 10 degrees. So things really change quickly in March and April. Our feature object this month, I'm going to take a look at a constellation that's just coming up towards the highest point in the sky, so the zenith and the meridian at sunset. This is called M44, the Beehive Cluster, also known as, known as Praesipi, which is Latin for manger. Uh, it's an open cluster in the constellation of Cancer, one of the nearest star clusters to Earth. Under dark skies, you can actually see a small nebulous object um, visible to the naked eye. So great with binoculars and fantastic with a telescope and low power. So here is the, right after sunset, here's the southern point in the sky. You go up and a little bit to the left is this dim Y-shaped constellation. It's ahead of the sickle of Leo the Lion, which is very obvious. And right in here near the junction of the Y, upside down Y, is the star cluster. Your Colorado Observing Challenge. 
is going to be the Lyria meteor shower. Uh, go sit out in a lawn chair on the night of the f around April 21st and look towards the constellation of Lyra the Lyre. Uh, this is rising in the northeast sky after 10 o'clock, so you don't have to stay up till 3 in the morning like some meteor showers. Uh, this is debris left over from the Comet C, 1861 G1 Thatcher. And the radiant the point that all the little meteors seem to be coming away from is up here to the upper right of the constellation of Lyra and the bright star Vega. Okay, astronomy events near Longmont this month. Everything is starting to come back on. Uh, Longmont Astronomical Society on April 21st at 6.30. The visible uh, broadband imager of the Daniel K. Inoki Solar Telescope. This is by um, Friedrich Lorger. They do have a observing night planned with Boulder County open space. You need to register and they'll give you the location, but it starts now at 7.15. Little Thompson Observatory uh, is reopening. They aren't doing public nights yet, but you can um, make reservations and uh, take a look through the telescope and get a private talk about astronomy and topics like that. Um, masks and vac vaccinations are recommended, but not required. Estes Park Memorial Observatory is uh, open Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, limited to 12 people. See their site for guidelines. Northern Colorado Astronomical Society is sticking with a video webcast. Uh, Dr. Angela Stickle, double asteroid redirection test uh, is the topic, April 7th at 6.15. Fisk Planetarium is reopened in April, and it seems to be that they are just back to normal i don't see any restrictions on their site so maybe look closer than i did and see if you can see anything but i think you can go and enjoy it and their observatory evenings are open again april 1st 8 15 and 22nd from 8 to 10. check out colorado edu slash sbo for summer's wash and finally our historical missteps in astronomy in about 30 seconds we're going to look at Percival Lowell and the canals on Mars. So it kind of began with uh, Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli, who was director of the Milan Observatory, and he drew pictures of canals on Mars. Now he called them Canal A, uh, which properly uh, means channels. So he was not implying himself that these were artificial canals, but Percival Lowell took it and ran with it. 1893 to about 1908, he studied Mars a bunch and made lots of drawings. This is just a few sketches over here on the lower right. He published three books of these, Mars in 1895, Mars and its Canals in 1906, Mars as an Abode of Life in 1908. He came up with a whole story of a water-starved civilization that was desperately clinging to getting water from the polar caps down to where the cities were and, and like that. So I think he also got excited about stuff happening on Venus as well. Uh, but he really popularized this belief that uh, Mars sustained intelligent life forms. From this we get the War of the Worlds, uh, both the original radio broadcast by Mercury Theater and Orson Welles and movies and everything else from that. Mariner four flew by Mars in 1965 and saw craters but no canals, kind of putting the end to that. They even thought that some of the big dark lava fields are vegetation. Because of the dust storms that come and go, they thought the vegetation was going through seasonal changes. There's a real picture of Mars today. It is a big canyon, though. It's much deeper than the Grand Canyon and would stretch completely across the United States from LA to New York. If you have any additions and corrections like that, uh, contact me at johnansworth at gmail.com. This has been the Skies Over Colorado for April 2022. Keep looking up.